This video is brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning community for creators with more than 25,000 classes in design, business, and more. The first 500 of my subscribers to use the link below will get a two-month free trial. During the never-ceasing rivalry between Coca-Cola and Pepsi, each company has made some spectacularly bad marketing decisions to try and one-up the other. From Coke's baffling decision to spend $100 million filling cans of their soda with water that smelled like farts, to Pepsi somehow accidentally promising customers who bought enough of their soda a Harrier jet. And don't even get us started on that time that Coca-Cola decided to stop making their best-selling product, Coca-Cola, because taste tests, even the ones they conducted, very concerningly showed people preferred Pepsi to Coke, and they thought for sure it was only a matter of time before Pepsi overtook Coca-Cola in popularity. It was this that caused them to come up with a new product to give the brand name to, and stopped making what had been for decades, and still was at the time, by far the world's best-selling soft drink. It's the classic slaughter your troops and burn your own castle down before your enemy gets the chance strategy. We really couldn't make this stuff up. And this all brings us to the subject of the day, and that's the time that Pepsi ran a promotion that resulted in 800,000 customers being promised $40,000 each. And for those who don't want to do the math here, that's a potential spend of about $32 billion, or adjusted for inflation, about $50 billion today. The origins of this particular corporate horror story can be traced back to the early 1990s, when PepsiCo was struggling to gain a foothold in the Philippines. Noted as being the 12th biggest market for soft drink consumption at that time, Coca-Cola controlled about 75% of the market, while Pepsi only had 17%. In an effort to push Coca-Cola off their throne, Pepsi enlisted the help of a Mexican marketing company called DG Consultores. Together, they workshopped what would eventually be known as the Number Fever Campaign. Mechanically, the promotion was similar to other giveaways that Soda Giant had taken part in, revolving around the collection of bottle caps for various Pepsi products, including Pepsi itself, as well as Mountain Dew and 7-Up. On these caps was printed a seemingly random three-digit number. Each day, Pepsi would announce one of these numbers on Filipino television, and a prize ranging from 100 pesos, about $4 then and $7 today, to a million pesos, which was $40,000 then or $71,000 today, would then be awarded to the holders of those numbers. To ensure that they didn't hand out too many prizes, an algorithm was used to ensure only a specific amount of winning bottle caps were printed. This algorithm was tweaked such that the entire spend for the prizes on the campaign would not exceed around $2 million. To add an air of pomp and circumstance to the whole ordeal, the winning numbers were stored in a fancy bank vault and delivered to a designated TV studio, specifically Channel 2 News in Manila, every day, though as the promotion grew, other stations picked it up as well. Officially launched in the opening months of 1992, the promotion was a hit and saw sales of Pepsi products spike by 40% in the region almost overnight. In terms of raw market share, at its peak, the additional sales helped Pepsi capture a further 9% of the Filipino soda market. In the end, an estimated 31 million Filipinos bought a promotional Pepsi product during the time of the promotion, a number for the curious that amounted to roughly half of the country's population at that time. Speaking of grand prize winners, to ensure that they had complete control over how many people won it, Pepsi handed down a list of forbidden numbers to DG Consultores, who were handling the distribution side of the promotion. These were reserved exclusively for the grand prize that bottlers absolutely would not print on the inside of caps. Initially, the campaign ran without a hitch, and by May of that year, there had been 17 grand prize winners, while thousands more had won smaller prizes. This all changed, though, when on May the 25th, Channel 2 announced that the final grand prize would be awarded to anyone holding a bottle cap with the number 349 printed on it, a number that was on the list of forbidden numbers to be picked as a winner, importantly, because it was printed on about 800,000 bottle caps. Who exactly screwed up here isn't really known, though presumably internally someone missed out on the Employee of the Month award on this one. But whatever the case, as you can imagine, people holding bottle caps with the number 349 on them were very keen to claim their rather large prize, with tens of thousands of people turning up to Pepsi plants across the country demanding their money. And just for the curious here, that number is about half of the entire gross domestic product of the Philippines, which at the time stood at 
$52 billion. Unwilling to pay out the billions of dollars it would cost to honor each winning bottle cap, Pepsi instructed officials at the locations to simply turn people away and claim that the number 349 had been announced in error. Naturally, when it was announced that no prizes would be awarded for this number, this caused mass outrage and riots broke out at Pepsi locations across the Philippines. To appease the masses, Pepsi announced that they would offer anyone holding a 349 bottle cap 5,000 pesos, which was about $18 at the time or $32,000 today, and they said this was a gesture of goodwill. How they settled on this number isn't clear, but it's noteworthy that this did tack on an additional spend of nearly $9 million for Pepsi and closer to $17 million if all 800,000 or so caps were found. For some reason, people who'd initially been expecting a literal million peso payday didn't respond well to this offer, and thousands of them filed suit against the company. One woman, Paciencia Salem, even vowed that when she died, to quote her, my ghost will come to fight Pepsi. It's also noteworthy that her husband died of a heart attack during a Pepsi boycott march shortly before she said this in an interview. On that note, many chose to take out their frustrations on the company more directly, storming Pepsi officers and bottling plants, the latter of which were forced to employ armed guards and put up barbed wire fences to keep out angry customers. Naturally, Pepsi wasted no time removing non-essential employees from the country until things calmed down. Violence against tangible representations of the company followed, with Pepsi delivery trucks being a particularly easy target for the collective wrath of the Filipino people, with a few dozen of them being destroyed. Tragically, one truck was even attacked by a man with a grenade, which ended up bouncing off its target and killing a schoolteacher and two children while severely wounding six more people. Rather than blame the man who threw the grenade, many in the masses blamed Pepsi for causing the whole fiasco in the first place. Calls for a boycott followed, since sales of Pepsi products nosedived across the country as the sustained negative coverage of their brands and the violence the promotion had caused dominated Filipino airwaves. However, once again proving that no matter how big of a screw-up you make, when it comes to soft drinks particularly, it doesn't seem to matter. Pepsi weathered the controversy completely, and sales recovered to former levels once the mods disbanded and the news moved on to other stories. Further from the legal side of things, Pepsi got off mostly scot-free here as well. While they did have to fight thousands of lawsuits over the issue up until 2006, that year a Philippines Supreme Court ruling definitively cleared them and they didn't end up having to pay anything to any of those who brought suit against the company. Now, if you'd like to learn about effective marketing rather than marketing that ends up in literally getting people killed, you should take a look at today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creators. They've got 25,000 classes in different areas like design, business, and much more. If you get Skillshare Premium Membership, you can join in all of those classes. Not that you could really actually do that, but theoretically, you could watch anything you want and you don't have to pay per class. It's perfect if you've got New Year's goals and you need some sort of improved skills for those. Whether you're looking to fuel curiosity, creativity, or an indeed your career, you can do it with Skillshare. Now you've heard me talk to death about all the classes I've taken on Skillshare, so for this one I just started randomly going through Skillshare and I found a class on going viral. And at that, to be honest, I scoffed a little because virality from experience I know is quite hard to engineer, but then again, this is taught by someone with tons more viral success than me, so I figure it's pretty legit and I actually decided that I would watch it as well, you know, never stop learning. So, Skillshare is also super affordable. All those courses are just $10 a month with an annual subscription. But the first 500 of you that sign up using the link in the description below will get a two-month free trial. And as always, thanks for watching.